Hi everyone, I'm Erica from Remote Worker, a UK job board for remote working professionals. I'm joined here today by Richard Kirk, Managing Director at Iceland UK, an award-winning food retail provider worldwide. Thank you very much for joining me today. No problem. So, Iceland is one of Britain's fastest growing and most innovative retailers, recognized as one of the best companies to work for in the UK, also celebrating now its 50 years of great service. Not only that, Iceland is committed to become the first major retailer globally to eliminate plastic packaging from all of its own brand products by the end of 2023. And they are not going under the slogan, doing it right for no reason. So given the notable success, I would like to ask you a few questions to further understand how Iceland have had to adapt and develop their needs over the past year what impact the pandemic has had on the company, and what actions the company has taken in its response. So Richard, can you start by providing a brief description of what Iceland does and how you as the managing director handles today, today operation of an international company? Yes, um, if I look at Iceland, I mean, Iceland is one of those, I've been with Iceland on and off for uh, a long, long time. Um, I was initially um, a stores director and then managing director of this business way back in the 80s and 90s. Initially, the business started off as a frozen food business, uh, only selling frozen food. But obviously, over the years, we changed and evolved and became more of a, a call it a convenience store, but more of a discount store, but still really focusing in on frozen food. Um, over the last couple of years, the business has changed dramatically with a big swing because into different areas. If we look at our business as of today, which is, I suppose, where we should be looking, we, we have three parts to our business. We still have the old core Iceland, and the core Iceland is our high street business. That's how we started selling food in the high street. And as the high street sort of grew, we put more and more stores into the high street, and then started to move some of the stores online. Around about five or six years ago, we launched our food warehouse, which was a much larger concept, Again, selling a much wider range of food, but still very much focusing in on frozen food, some larger packs, but also just more range right across the, uh, uh, the breadth of, uh, of the product ranges. And um, that's developed into about around 20% of our business. On top of that, if we look back 18 months, online was only less than 10% of our business. And now it's over 20% of a business. So suddenly you can see that change in mix where we're, the high street, which was 100%, is now 60. We've got 20 odd percent in uh, food warehouse and 20% online. That's changed so much in what we what we do and how we operate. But in the last few weeks, again, we're starting to see some change again because as the high street opens up as people go back to normal, as people get vaccinated and become more confident, we're seeing people drift back to the high street. That's the people who have lost on the high street tend to be older people who've been scared to go out using public transport. They're, I mean, if you think who was on the high street during the week, people are at work or they were at work. So you've only got really generally other than on a Saturday, Sunday, older people and young mums with kids who aren't working. So, you know, that's starting to change. But we're also seeing online where people, again, move away. Perhaps they were only using online just because they were scared to go out. So those dynamics are changing the market uh, uh, and have done over the years. And we're seeing that change continue now. No, oh, it's great. Thank you. And what was Iceland's first reaction to the pandemic and what impact did it have on the company? Um, well, to be honest with you, sales, it's, we're a food business. Uh, so we saw our, fail, our sales go up. Uh, particularly online, as I've said, but we saw the high street fall away. We saw our cost dramatically increase because of additional people we had to take on with all the COVID restrictions. Literally, uh, uh, the, the, the COVID restrictions we had to put in, the work we had to, to put in to protect our uh, colleagues cost millions, many, many millions last year. So a big, big change. And we're all still sort of scratching our head and saying to ourselves, will those people come back to the high street? I mean, at the moment, we've sort of opened up this week, but we're not seeing any big leap in sales. And if we look around and we read what's happening, and uh, yesterday I was reading a BBC article on um, uh, 
a consultancy called Springboard, and Springboard do all this information on customer flow and who's out and who's back in the high street and so on. And uh, as of yesterday, they were saying that high streets are sort of 35% down in transactions against last year. Retail parks are back to flat with last year, but actually week on week, sales transactions are slightly down. People just don't seem to have gone out. Whether it's the weather, I mean, it's freezing cold. We'll have to wait and see for another few weeks and see what happens. Exactly. I guess people, people are still nervous. Yeah, they are pretty much. I think they are yeah. pretty much still nervous, still waiting for everything to come back to normal. Yeah, I mean, 1st of June, who knows? I mean, a lot of our business in town is what I've said, but also there's lots of shops that have closed, but there's loads of offices, you know, hundreds of accountants, solicitors, small offices, um, you know, building societies, banks, where hardly anybody's gone back to work. Exactly. So all those people, you know, are, are high street shoppers. And I guess one day they'll come back. But my view is perhaps they won't be back until October. Yeah. <laughs> and would you say that you and your team were prepared to handle the crisis? Or did your business plan need to change in its response? Oh, yeah, we had to do some, make some massive changes, as I've said, because of the, the, the channel mix was the most uh, demanding. But we also saw the, what, what we sell change. I mean, a lot of things that you used to sell, if you, I'll give you a good example, things like bread and milk, which is a good example, which are almost daily purchase. Those sales dropped away. But in other areas, we saw the sales power away in, the, you know, in a different way. Slimming World is a big part of our business. You know, we sell a whole range of Slimming World. Well, all the Slimming World groups closed down. So we saw the sales of our Slimming World products drop off. So, you know, lots of change going on. But overall, I would say it was beneficial for us. Oh, great. And what were the most challenging obstacles you had to overcome? And what solution have you been able to apply? Adapting our stores to, uh, to COVID. I mean, initially, there were, people were really scared. I mean, if you mm. think about uh, what we had to do wearing a mask and so on, and now people are used to shopping in a supermarket. I guess you mm. go in now, I never think. I mean, I've been out in shops all the way through it, but in between, how when I see it now, and when I think back to sort of you know, 15 months or whatever it was last March, there was nobody out at all. There was the odd person scurrying around with a mask on and they were yeah. buying everything they can, you know, they were panic buying paper, for toilet rolls and soup and you name it. And uh, uh, our, our average basket sort of at that particular time doubled. I mean, people were just so scared they thought they'd have to batten down the hatches for a month. Exactly, bunkering was. up. And <laughs> yeah, well, they thought they were going to be battened down for a month and they yeah. didn't lock back for a year and a half. But it's amazing how people get used to it. And exactly. Yeah. I mean, our, our strength was our colleagues, our in-store colleagues. To be fair, we've been on the front line and worked through all this all along. I mean, of course, they've been careful. Of course, they've been wearing masks. But you know what? They've really, really been on that front line. Not like nurses. You're not in, in contact with people with COVID. But you are in contact with thousands of people in the general public. And who knows? You know, I think they've done an amazing job. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And would you say that there are any challenges right now? Yeah, there always is. I mean, what, because the business changes and people start to perhaps drift back to the big supermarkets. I think the biggest challenge is the high street. You know, mm. lots of shops have closed down. You've got exactly. government has to do something to attract people back into the high street. You know, cut the business rates for another few years. Develop markets in town centres. Get some. You know, do something. They've got to do something. Pretty major. I walked around my local town on uh, uh, Saturday in Chester. It was raining, but it was, you know, Debenhams have closed now. And, you know, it was an anchor store in the town. I walked around the precinct and I would say it was 50% empty of shops. Mm. It's a shame. Yeah, it's know. really a shame. Definitely. It will uh, change. It will change. It? it will yeah. change. More and more, more and more of the shops are becoming restaurants and bars. And exactly. Town centres become more about hospitality than just shopping. Mm. And how has coronavirus um, affected hiring and demand in your industry? Um, well, we've had a lot of temporary people on. We've taken lots of drivers on for our home delivery. Thousands mm. uh, of drivers. A lot of colleagues in the stores came in part-time. where Lots of people were furloughed. Some came in just on a temporary basis to work for us and have now gone back to what they did before. So, uh, you know, and the, over the years, I'm trying to think back now to last year, we had several 
thousand people off with either symptoms of corona mm -hmm. or they were in contact so they were self-isolating you know and so to try and take up that slack in our stores where you've got you know, maybe 10 members of staff or two it just wasn't easy no i understand and now after months of lockdown and social distancing consumers have been forced to shop differently reprioritizing what is essential and swapping the checkout line for online shopping more than ever before yeah. so what change are you able to see when it comes to online shopping and shopping in stores can you see if the consumer behavior has changed since the start of pandemic in iceland well uh, i'm i'm not quite certain what you mean by what, what do you mean by how has it, has it changed i mean the, the, the change for an online shopper against our core shoppers they spend a lot more the mm. basket is a lot bigger as you'd guess um, I mean, the one thing in Iceland, we we don't charge for sorry, we don't charge for delivery above a certain. Uh, sorry. No worries. My son, my son, ringing me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't we don't charge once we get past a certain basket. So we are unusual in that regard, um, and that of course drives quite a much larger basket. But the sort of mix of products that we're selling is pretty similar, maybe a little bit more of our luxury products have been sold online because again, you attract a, more, a, a slightly more affluent customer, I guess. Mm. A lot of brands, we've seen a lot of people shift back to brands where people somehow just feel safe with the brands, you know, whether it be Heinz or whether it's Bird's Eye or the brands that mum knows and had as a kid, she just thinks, you know what, I'm going to stick to that brand because I know it and I feel it's safe and the quality is right. So, you know, a few things changing like that. Exactly. So um, the single most important action companies have taken in its response to the pandemic is focusing on employees' well-being. So how has Iceland chosen to provide support to its employees' well-being during the lockdowns? Well, as I said, I think we've done everything we possibly can to protect those employees. We In the office here, people have been working remotely. We've obviously tried to make sure the office is as safe as possible. We still don't have everybody, everybody back here, and I guess we never will. In the stores, it's a little more difficult. Um, of course, we've introduced all the shields at the checkouts, and social distancing. But, you know, you, when you go in the back area, and my colleagues in the back area, they are often quite often close together, but we insist that they wear the masks. And you can only do as much as you can. It's, um, you know, you... It, it, this has been quite difficult in this pandemic, you know, because there's all the social distancing and you can't mix and you can't do whatever you can't do. Mm. But actually, when you look into offices and you look into retail, colleagues have been working together in quite close proximity for the last year or so. You know, I do personally feel that we are maybe getting a little bit uh, wrapped up in it and wonder if we are just getting a little bit too uh, too cautious as a as a nation. Yeah. Definitely. I don't, and, want to be about that. don't get me wrong. I'm not being blase, but you know. No, I understand. You know, we, if in the workplace, I can sit next to somebody. I could have a meeting in here mm. with six people. I sit next to them, but actually, at night time, I couldn't have a drink with them. <laughs> <laughs> and and we were talking about remote work. Um, how is has that been working um, with your employees? Have that been a successful thing? Yeah, it has, and it's worked well. Uh, but there's nothing compares to having your colleagues back in the in the office. Oh, of course. Because you know, Zoom calls like this is great. But normally, there's a string of people on the bottom of the screen here. You know, all wanting to say something. They can't. They can't get into the conversation. You don't. Mm. You don't get that interaction. The young people who come in don't understand how things work, how meetings work. You know, how can they have their say? They don't see how the boss motivates the team you know there's so much that goes on and do you know what it, when i'm in here i walk around and so does my uh, uh chairman and ceo they walk around here talk to people and that's what you do you know you're in and out of different people's offices in the office space and if you want to know something a few minutes ago the trading directors of the business work for me so i just give them a shout come to my office for 10 minutes we all get around and have a chat and this is what we're going to do you can't do it on uh, zoom Mm. And it worked okay, but I, I think again, from to be honest with you, I'm not seeing people get back, which I thought they would do. Supplier meetings, we've almost had in a year, I think we've only had half a dozen meetings in the office in a mm. year. Mm. Every single 
people on is people working from home. I, I honestly, maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, see, I don't quite get it. <laughs> I think we need, I think to get Britain moving again, we need to get people back in the office. Yeah. And now when the economies uh, are reopening, um, many companies in the UK are actually thinking of um, putting on combined remote work with time in the office to get the mess, uh, best mix of productivity and collaboration. Yeah. And are you thinking of, like in Iceland, that uh, um, you're thinking of implementing this hybrid approach when more employees yeah, are asking for it? Yeah, we are, but we're still trying to say, look, you know, some, it depends on the department. If you're um, in the IT department, in your programming or whatever you're doing, it wouldn't really make that much if you come in for a day and you can do mm. the rest of it at home, provided you do the work, which they will. But I think if you're a trading manager or a buyer, you've got to be in here. You've got to be with talking to the technologists. You've got to be talking to your mm. boss. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be talking to suppliers and all those sort of things. So I think you've got to go to the kitchen, the, the, the development kitchen. There's all that sort of side of it. It depends what the job is. I mean, but if you work in a shop, you can't work from home, can you? No. That's true. <laughs> uh, that's a bit odd, you know, you've got all the banks who are doing it. Well, yeah. You know, uh, fair enough if that's what they want to do. But I always think, again, if you're in retail, it's hard and you've had to work all the way through this. So mm -hmm. I think we have a little bit of a responsibility to our um, retail colleagues to support them. So the, this outbreak is a sharp reminder that pandemics, like other really occurring catastrophes, have happened in the past and will continue to happen in the future. Even though we cannot prevent viruses from emerging, we should prepare to dampen their effects on society. What lessons have you learned from the crisis? And could there be a situation that we can learn from since the start of this and look to strengthen the future of our businesses and employment? Um, gosh. Uh, of course, yes. I mean, if we have another pandemic, I think we've been through one, so we've got a good idea that we're, what we need to do. Uh, I think uh, the problem with this one is we're all learning as we went along, and there's been lots of criticism uh, about the government and how it's been handled, although in the, the vaccination programme has been absolutely amazing. But, you know, when you look back, everybody with hindsight would have done it differently. But um, my view is that at the time, I mean, I honestly thought it was a daft idea to start with, and then I thought which had only been locked down for a month. And then in no way when it came out in June did I ever imagine it would be going back in again, you know. So I, I think we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot how we operate and I think some of the things will stay. I mean, in terms of social distancing, it'll take years. But I guess if the pandemics and there isn't another resurgence or a different one, people will forget, you know, in five years time, you'll have forgotten all about it. Yeah. And uh, we'll all be back to, oh, I hope we are anyway. We will come yeah. back to normal nice eventually. Bars and packed out and, you know, just enjoying yourself. Yeah. We're now slowly starting to open up our society again. And I want to know what Iceland's forecast is for the future. What are the top priorities within the next few months? And do you have any new projects uh, going on that you would like to share? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we have. We've, we've, we've just opened our first convenience store. Uh, which is open, and we will, we will be opening some more, and we're part of the business. We're continuing to open food warehouses. We have 25 new food warehouses opening in the next uh, uh, nine months. Um, our core high street businesses, we're continuing to invest in and refurbish and change space to really sort of satisfy the demand that's out there in more fresh products, more chilled products, etc. So yeah, there's lots of things going on, lots of product development. And particularly in our frozen food area, we're developing a whole range of exclusive brands. If you went in our stores now, you'll see a lot of uh, ice creams under the uh, barrel <laughs> label. And uh, all these sort of sherbet lollies and cola bottles and strawberry milkshakes and so on. Uh, and I'll, TGI Fridays, TGIs, we've got a whole range of TGIs, we've got uh, Greg's, these are all exclusive to us and that's a key part of our strategy going forward is to de develop these exclusive brands that you can only buy in Iceland. Great, amazing news. Thank you very much for this interview and thank you so much for joining me today.